like a panorama in front of me, constantly. I could be in a room full of people, and um, if, uh, there was a time when I was, let's say, in Skarzysko, I didn't, I didn't talk at all. And um, I, just, I just couldn't believe it. I just didn't talk. And then I was constantly talking after the war, because then I realized I, I was afraid if I won't talk, I'll see everything. when uh, they took us out of uh, our home, home, room, that what they did, which a lot of people left their children in carriages, hoping somebody will take them. But nobody did, so they knew they were Jewish children. They just grabbed them, just threw them on the trucks, and the old people just threw them. And uh, cripples, they just right in front of us, just in the head, just shot in the head, just like, like there were no human beings. So those things that just stay with you. This is something you don't forget. So you see the trucks, you see the babies, you see screaming mothers, you see um, hanging people. You sit and all of a sudden you see that face there. I was working in town, we were gathering wood. And uh, they had to supply a horse and wagon to drag the wood to the German police department. And I see a man, of a farmer, his name was Nitek. Tall farmer, a mustache, a redhead mustache, turn. He used to be one of our better customers. So he recognized me. I used to bring his shoes, uh, deliver his shoes with my father. He used to let me into the field before the war, pick strawberries. And Yitek was like a friend of the family, you know. He was a good customer, but also like a, like a nice person. So he told me, he pulled me away on the side, and he told me that what the eyes have seen when they evacuated the people, how women tore their heads out, you know. It was, it was a warm day in early fall. It was a warm day. I remember the sun was shining, everything, but not for Jews. So he told me, and uh, later we found out, we, we found out. We didn't want to believe that such a thing is possible. What did he tell you? He tell you the, the, the tragic march, 15 kilometers from Zwolling to Garbatka, where it was a train station and how they packed them in, because he had to stay there until everything is, uh, all the cattle cars are sealed, so they can go home. And I myself have experienced evacuation from uh, Skarzysk to Buchenwald, when the Russian front came near. We were in trains for a few days, so we couldn't go out, we couldn't relieve ourselves. So I must, and then, and, uh, After the war, you read, you read some books, how it's described, and uh, everything else is history. And I remember we were laying on the, uh, on the barracks there, no parents, alone, cold, hungry. How my brother was always praying. So for some strange reason, he became religious and started to pray. He prays as he shouldn't be killed for a bullet. So he became sick, and they took him to the hospital. They didn't give him any medication. And one night I came up there, and I myself was sick before, uh, typhus, and he had typhus fever. And I knew the feeling from experience. Um, and he was laying there in bed. He said, he gave me the jacket, the blue jacket. He said, here, yeah, I don't need it.
and they took him out. They cleaned up the hospital. And they took him out to Verkce in Skarzysko, and they shot him. I had a baby boy. And uh, I didn't have food for the baby. So I took out, I took milk from my breast and I sold to other mothers for a piece of soap, a potato. And I didn't have where to put the baby, so we had a chair and we cut off one leg of the chair in order to rock the baby. The chair should rock. So we put the baby there on the chair. And um, while I was taking milk, I was uh, getting lumps in my breast. And I went to the doctor, and she said that uh, I have pus in my breast because I didn't have the proper food. And I started to have pain. And she says, we have to operate. So. I had to go there by myself, and I went, and she operated with no injections. They took us with the buses, they brought us to a big airfield, and nearby were our trains, the cattle trains. And um, as I look back, at, I think at the, for a while I was in a daze. I didn't know what was happening, actually. I saw they taking away the men separate, the children separate, and the women separate. So I had, had the baby, and I took the, the coats that I had, with the, the bundles, and I wrapped around the baby, and I put it on, on my left side, because I saw the Germans were saying left and right. And I went through with the baby. But the baby was short of breath started to choke, to choke, and it started to cry. So the German called me back. He says, well, what do you have there in German? Now, I didn't know what to do because everything was so fast and everything happened so suddenly. I wasn't prepared for it. To look back, the experience was, I think I was numb or something happened to me, I don't know. But it wasn't, I wasn't there even. And um, he stretched out his arms. I should hand him over the bundle. And I hand him over the bundle. And this was the last time I had the bundle. But as I look back, I don't think that I had anybody with me. I was alone within myself. And since that time, I think all my life I've been alone. Even when I met Jack, I didn't tell Jack my past. Jack just found out recently. I think, to me, I was dead. I died, and I didn't want to hear nothing. I didn't want to know nothing. And I didn't want to talk about it. And I didn't want to admit to myself that this happened to me. And I stood off, I found the doctor who operated on me in the ghetto. And they brought us in there. And when she saw me there, she was so happy to see me. And right away she said, what did the, what hap where's the baby? What happened to the baby? And right there, I said, what baby? I said to the doctor, what baby? I didn't have a baby. I don't know of any baby. That's what it did to me. Does it seem possible that 10 years have passed since you were originally interviewed? Um, I wonder if you can remember back 10 years ago about the interview experience itself. What comes to mind? Well, uh, it was scary because this is the time we started to speak about our um, incidents, what happened to us. Up till, that, till then, we always suppressed things. 
or I don't know, we didn't want to talk about it. Uh, maybe nobody wanted to listen. And maybe because we just didn't feel like talking about it because it was painful. And uh, it, it took me quite a while to come down from that interview. Every so and then you get something where you just can't pull it out of your mind. And this is when I got older. The, more, the older I get, the more I think of that particular person. People did get married in, uh, in the ghetto. People think that the ghetto was just, you know, closed in. They were getting married because people had hope things will go on. And there was that uh, my mother's a friend's daughter. She was 18 years old, Rachel Goldfarb. I have to mention names. They're not here. She got married and she got pregnant, became pregnant. And when we had the, uh, when they took us out of the city, we didn't have a train, there were no trains, to, to walk to the trains, which was, um, I don't know, six kilometers, 12, I don't know, the, the mileage is to Garbatka. And I always remember Rachel, that the Rachel. Oh, she had a very big stomach. I mean, I was 11 and a half, 12, close to 12. So at the time, it didn't, you know, you don't think about things like this. She was pregnant and she was very big. It was very hot. It was the second day of Sukkot, and it happened to be very hot. And she was wearing a trench coat and her father's shoes. And that's something I can't forget it. Uh, and my mother, her mother, her father, and some other women were walking around and made a circle around her because, I don't know, either she would deliver the baby soon or they didn't want the SS to see her. I don't know. And um, she never complained. She never asked for water or anything. Years and years later, when I had my own children, all of a sudden she came to mine. I mean, uh, all that time, it was just like everything else. But when I became pregnant, over some Rachel's face was always in front of me, what happened to her. The older you get, the more, how can I put this here, um, frustrating and, and horrifying fascination that people let this happen. That there's a bunch of people marching. Old people are shot, crippled people are shot. <clears throat> And there again, not too many people lived through that particular um, uh, time where, or epoch where you march to the trains and, and you still talk about it. You're not on the train. I mean, you, I'm still here. I mean, they walked us to the trains. And we smelled the chlorine or whatever they had on the train. We could smell it because we were sitting here and the trains were just a little farther up. How do you forget this year? I mean, you sit with your mother, you sit with little cousins and the beautiful babies, uncles and um, people you know, and, and you know what happened. I mean, you know they went to those trains and they probably choked to death in those trains. You don't forget things. The war began, and uh, we wore Jewish stars. And I remember my mother telling me that this is something that should make me very proud because, uh, because Jews were very special. It's sort of my first awareness of being a Jew. And then they began to take, the deportations began from Slovakia. Now what happened then, I remember very clearly, there was a uh, priest in Humene. Greek Orthodox priest. And the law, a law was passed that anybody who um, had converted to Christianity before 1938 would be exempt from being deported. He agreed to put on the list of people who had been converted, any Jew who wanted to be there, to fake the list. But he insisted that the children be fully baptized legally converted to Greek Orthodoxy. And so my parents chose to do that, and I was converted to be a Christian. I, was, I remember the holy water being poured over my head. And from that time, I have a vision. It, it was either a dream or a vision, I'm not sure which, 
but it, the whole image is very clear in my mind. This is the image. I'm on a meadow, and there are Jewish kids playing around me. And at one point, they move away from me, and I'm alone on this meadow. And God appears before me, and he's a mountain. And God holds in his hand an axe, and he just goes, but takes the axe over his head, and with a full swing, splits me in half, and I just break into two. Jew, Jew and Christian? I think it's more like killing me, like punishment. It doesn't feel like Jew and Christian. It feels like annihilation. That's what it feels like. I have like little vignettes, and, and they keep coming back. And more things keep coming back. As I write, I say, oh my goodness, I couldn't even remember that. I can't. I couldn't remember that my, my when I celebrated my birthday, in when I was hiding out, and uh, my father wanted to do something. He asked me, "What would you like for your birthday?" And I said, two scrambled eggs." And I said, "How are we going to get two scrambled eggs from the peasant?" Uh, we obviously have to bribe him. And we looked around in all our possessions. And I noticed him staring at me and staring at me, and I couldn't figure out what he was staring at. And finally, I saw it, and I, I picked up to my ears, you know, and, I, and he nodded. So I took off my two golden ears and gave it to him, and he gave it to the peasant. And within a few hours, I had two scrambled eggs. And I saw a father, the happiest father in the world, when he watched me. The only thing is, I, I couldn't really enjoy it because there were all these people around me watching me eat those two scrambled eggs. And to this day, I, I still keep dreaming about all these people watching me eating those two scrambled eggs. Well, I tried to find the people who had hidden me. And uh, it was, uh, well, <laughs> maybe uh, it was very difficult. Uh, and. Uh, as uh, we were driving down, the, down that street, um, I recognized the house. It was very strange, because I, I didn't know we were on, on the uh, street. It was amazing. <laughs> Not only that, but as I ran to the house, the name was on the doorbell. The was, same name? The same name. Although different people are living there now. But course. they're related, so they've uh -huh. kept a name. It turns out the granddaughter divorced and took back her maiden name. I don't quite understand. I don't know, of course, the granddaughter, but the name was on the doorbell. So it was... It was. It seemed incredible that after all these years of, of this sort of not remembering and, and hiding, to just go to a door and have and ring a doorbell and have the name. I think one of, one of the, the most difficult things about the whole experience had been partly the lack of memory, uh, and uh, feeling that as though it never happened, it was not true, and feeling quite lost and um, and. Uh, I think there were images which became very strong and that I may have fastened on and hung on to. And by now they're gone. I mean, by now all that is gone. It's really as though the waters have closed. My first memory of the horror of deportation was uh, this. We were warned that there would be a deportation. The, these, thing, these deportations came in waves. And if you somehow, I'm not clear on how it was legally, but if you survived it, then you were safe for a while again. There, was, there were some quotas that were to be met. And we went into hiding. Um, and I remember we were in an attic of a Gentile, friend of the family. And uh, I saw through a little crack in the window Jews being herded towards the railroad station. And when this was over, we went out, we came down again, and all the other Jews somehow came back that, that were not deported. And we were, we were some children of us. And we went looking to, 
to the houses that people were, were deport, deported from. And we went to the house of the Shoichet, the Shoichet from Humene. He lived in a very small house. The window was so low to the ground that even as a small child, I was able to look through it. And inside, there was nothing but rubble. Everything was broken up. And all over the floor, there were his uh, little books that he used to tear off tickets from to give you as a receipt for the chickens that you took to him to kill. Some were blue, some were green. And uh, I remember all I wanted to do was just get one of these books for myself. They looked very desirable. And then I, I crawled in through the window, and I took some of the books, and somehow then I realized that this man was taken away two years ago when I was uh, down in the chasm. Um, the feeling that overwhelmed me was that uh, there were people who only lived in my memory, that I was the only link to the world for, these, for the people, the shoichet of humene. And the feeling was just so uh, awful. But what I did was I called in my son, I, I was still in bed then, and I said, what I want you to do is hear about the shoichet of humene so that you will also remember him. And I told him about the shoichet of humene. And my son said to me, okay, I will remember him. And, and I know he will. 